While there's much hope and anticipation surrounding the so-called Arab Spring, the results may not always be what we're hoping for. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF. This is Global Perspectives, with Pulitzer Prize-winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Welcome to Global Perspectives. We've all seen the photos and video of the political upheaval that is sweeping across the Middle East and North Africa. Once entrenched leaders have fallen in several countries, giving way to movements that could lead to truly representative governments with democratic freedoms. These movements also show that relatively peaceful protests can result in desired change, and that the violence espoused by terrorist groups isn't necessary. But where did this sudden push toward representative government originate? Why now? What prompted people in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and elsewhere to say, enough? Our guest today will help us understand and sort through these questions. James Traub is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, as well as the author of several books, and has covered the Middle East and North Africa for years. Welcome, Mr. Traub. Thanks for joining us today. Well, happy to be here. Tell us a little bit about your experience in the Middle East. We've been paying a lot of attention to it in recent months because of the upheaval, but your background there goes back many, many years. How is the Middle East and North Africa different today than it was when you first started to look at it? Well, first I should say that the first time I visited the Middle East wasn't so very long ago. It was 2007 uh, when I went to Egypt. Uh, now I go back and forth to the Gulf area all the time. I, I teach class in, in Abu Dhabi, and I've also traveled throughout uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, uh, those, those areas. Um, I, I think the, the shocking thing about the Middle East was that uh, people like me who wrote about it all thought the day will come when there will be this democratic upheaval. But if you had asked us when that day would come, we would say not for a long time. And I think we all were so, it turns out, over-impressed by how adroit these autocrats were. Not only how ruthless they were, we all knew that, but just how clever they were at being able to uh, manipulate public opinion, at being able to give the impression of reform and liberalization, but really, in the end, in a way that, that choked off the possibility of real change. Uh, I think also it was obvious how embittered and alienated people were. But there was a sense that they were passive, that people had just accepted, uh, it, 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 with deep bitterness, accepted that nothing could change. You look at a country like Egypt, and, and you know, one would use kind of pharaonic metaphors. People have grown accustomed forever to submitting to a remote power. So I think they, we underestimated how close to the surface that anger was, how widespread it was. And the thing that was the most remarkable was once the, 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 uh, the bandwagon of revolution started in Tunisia in December of 2010, how fast it moved. That was astonishing. Now, there were relatively few observers, journalists, academics, others who saw this coming. Was this something that was sort of on your radar screen, or was the intensity of it a surprise for you? When I wrote about this specifically in the past, in, in 2008, I wrote a book about the whole idea of, of democracy promotion, the so-called freedom agenda the Bush administration had. And I actually went back to it recently because I wondered, did I make a complete fool of myself and say this is never going to happen or, or what? And I did say at the time, that given the rise of the internet, and given the rise also of an internet savvy, deeply alienated youth generation, it was wrong to think that this status quo would last. So again, as I say, there was an expectation that this would come, just a, a deep surprise that it would come as quickly as it did. So what was your initial reaction? Did you see, again, change coming quickly to these places or just leaders being removed? Well, I think, you know, each time this, this contagion moved, people would say, yes, 
but it can't happen there to this other place. But the fact is, the first place where it occurred, Tunisia, wasn't on anybody's radar screen. So when people thought, where is there going to be this, could a popular uprising even occur, Egypt would have been much more likely. Yemen, a very divided society, would have been more likely. Tunisia was odd because, for several reasons, one, Tunisia was one of the most ruthlessly autocratic countries in the Middle East. When people would class countries in terms of how autocratic they were, you would put Tunisia more or less with Libya and Syria and Saudi Arabia at the far edge of autocracy. Then it was also true that Tunisia was less impoverished. Tunisia was a relatively, you would never say well off, but a more middle income country, more urbanized country. And so there also was the sense that the level of economic grievance wasn't the same. What people missed was that it was precisely because you had a relatively educated and urbanized population that people's rage at the corruption of the ruling regime, the Ben Ali family, the President Ben Ali and his, especially his wife's family, was so powerful that it wasn't people's absolute poverty, it was the sense of the immense wealth and, and flagrancy of their life as opposed to the way people were living. And so that was the local cause in Tunisia. It had a slightly different local cause, or let's just say more like spark in each place where it happened, though fundamentally the motivations of protesters were the same. What differentiated the outcomes was that the power of leaders were this different, the reactions of leaders were different, so that meant you've had very different outcomes in different countries. What has this meant based on your analysis of the situations? There were some who thought representative semi-democratic systems would emerge. There were others who thought we were going to be in for a long period of turmoil and uncertainties. Some even suggested we would go through this and maybe even be back where we started. Yeah. Uh, what, what's your assessment at well, this stage? you know, the, the imagery is so euphoric. Right? I mean, it was only six, seven months ago that we were watching Al Jazeera streaming live as Mubarak's, uh, President Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, his, his, his resignation was announced. Or when President Ben Ali of Tunisia fled. Or, of course, much more recently in, in Libya, the, the uh, toppling of, of the Gaddafi forces. And so that leads people to think that we've reached the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, but the fact is, in some ways, the toppling of the dictator is the easy part, difficult though it has obviously been in, in Libya. The hard part is what is to come. So if you ask, what are my expectations? I think that it's gonna take a lot of patience on the part of Arab peoples and on the part of outsiders because it's going to be really, really rough. Uh, right now in Egypt, you have a, an interim government which is entirely controlled by the military, which is going to be there maybe until, it could be until early 2013. And these people are not Democrats. They're army people. They have the same mentality as Mubarak. Now, I do believe that they don't want power. I do believe they're going to step out of the way. But I fear they'll do a lot of damage to Egypt's political culture by the time they do. And so whoever takes over in Egypt is going to have massive, unfulfilled economic expectations to meet and can have a very fractured political culture to deal with. And so it's going to be really hard. And if you think about democratizing countries, whether in Latin America or West Africa or anywhere, it looks bad for a long time. And so it could be a generation before uh, countries like Egypt or Tunisia or Libya have a really stable liberal democracy. And the question will always be, are they moving in the right direction? And no way of knowing now whether that's going to be the case. We just hope so. And what about the possibility of subsequent uprisings once people have seen that they have the ability to stand up and change a system? Could we have recurring demonstrations in some of these countries if people perceive that the system is not moving in a positive, constructive yeah, direction. I think, I think, again, look at Egypt. So what's happening in Egypt now is uh, you have this suddenly entrenched interim government which uh, is using uh, secret courts, emergency laws, totally opaque, never explains its decisions. The only way to get their attention is to go back into Tahrir Square. And so now you have this back and forth between this diktat that emerges from the so-called SCAF, that's the name of the interim government, and then 
a reaction, a public reaction in Tahrir Square. And so suddenly this form of public anger and, and insurrection becomes the only effective form of political speech. Well, that is not a habit you want to inculcate, but it's going to remain that way for some while to come, at least until there are elections. So what, what do we have at this point? And then where do you think all of these movements are going? I know, again, the popular perception was they were heading in a, quote, democratic yeah. direction, but that hasn't been demonstrated, and we don't really know. We have such a mixed picture. I mean, that's why, as I said earlier, it's not that the motivations in each country differ that much. You know, people use the same words, dignity, you know, especially dignity, but the hatred of corruption and high-handedness, and they want to have a meaningful future. But the difference in outcome is radically different depending on whether, for example, the army sticks with the leader or not. So you now have three countries where the leader's been deposed, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. You have three countries where there is a bloody military stalemate, which is to say Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain. Uh, and so um, what are the prospects that, for example, those blocked countries, that something's going to change? I mean, Yemen is very unstable. It's very hard to predict what's going to happen because you have an army that's divided in half. You have an entire populace that has risen up against a profoundly unpopular leader, but that leader is, is, is insisting on staying. I don't know. In a way, Syria is similar to that. Uh, again, President Assad's legitimacy is gone. And policymakers in the West are thinking what's going to be next. He can't last. Well, he can't, but he could last a long time before he goes. And so that's going to be really ugly. And there are places where it is quite possible that we will think whatever comes after is even worse than what came before. Um, the cynical view would be all, every place is going to look worse after than before. I don't think that's true. But the only place I feel confident about is Tunisia looks pretty good. And I think some of the more progressive monarchies, meaning Morocco and Jordan, where you have young kings, relatively well regarded by their population. There's some possibility there that you actually can have reform, meaningful reform that actually leads to a more liberal, if not fully democratic state. But it's going to be really varied. There is not going to be one Arab Spring outcome at all. It's going to go a whole spectrum from, from revolution to reform to reaction. What about the effect this is having or could have on relations between the Arab world and Israel, for example, the peace process and other related topics? Yeah, I mean, clearly uh, Israel views this as bad. And it does make you think they should have made peace while they had someone to make peace with. Because all these autocrats were essentially able to ignore public opinion. That's what makes them an autocrat. Public opinion in the Middle East is as one on the question of Palestine and Israel. There's deep hostility towards Israel in all of these countries. Uh, there is an absolute certainty that Palestinians deserve a state. There is much less agreement that Israel deserves a state. And so as these countries become more democratic, and even in the way the ones that don't become democratic but the leaders are weaker and therefore feel they have to find a way of diverting public criticism from themselves, then Weighing in more heavily on the side of the Palestinians as opposed to this Israel is going to be, uh, I think, a major theme. The only countervailing element is Palestine served as the escape valve for all these autocrats. They would say, don't get angry at me, get angry at Israel. Well, people are now focused on their own lives. They're not focused on this more remote and more symbolic issue of Palestine. They're focused on themselves. At, at several points during this discussion, there have been questions about what the outside world, the outside world beyond the Middle East and North Africa, namely the United States, Europe, and so forth, should do, might do, uh, and a lot of calls in the United States for U.S. involvement to be very, very limited. Right. Um, what does all of this mean for the United States? Should our role be as limited as it has been to date, or do you think we should be doing something more aggressive, especially in cases such as Syria, where the abuses have been so egregious. I think, I think President Obama realizes that, the, that American leverage is really limited. One big difference between Obama and Bush was that Bush exaggerated what the United States could do. And so he spoke in these great terms about the freedom agenda. And he tried to push President Mubarak of Egypt into having free elections. 
and he pushed him about halfway. Mubarak had about half a free election, and when the things started going against him, he cracked down, and Bush didn't say a word, called Bush's bluff, and he went on doing his thing. Obama doesn't want to make that mistake. He does not want to put the United States in a position where they are making demands that cannot be satisfied. So, for example, in Libya, he was reluctant to play a role. When he did play a role, he was actually quite happy to not play the lead role, even though in terms of providing military hardware, the United States clearly was the key country at the outset. <clears throat> it was not in the lead, and it receded over time. And I think Obama's quite happy with that kind of system. In other cases where I suspect had someone like George Bush still been president, there'd be much louder rhetoric, Syria. Obama has restrained the rhetoric. But if you ask, what could he be doing? The answer is not a whole lot more. I mean, the only way, the only form of leverage the West is going to have on Syria is economic leverage through sanctions. The United States already basically has totally sanctioned Syria. A big issue now is that the Europeans are going to stop buying oil from Syria. Syria, uh, Europe is Syria's big uh, uh, oil um, export source. So that can make a difference. And that, but that's a much slower form of pressure, and one that may be less effective than a military intervention. But we're only going to have one military intervention. We had it in Libya. You could argue that, that it is as deserved in Syria as it is in Libya. That may be true, but in the real world, it's not going to happen again. Could you summarize for our viewers what you think are the main U.S. interests in this region that make it so important to us? Well, there, there is an, uh, an obvious national security interest in oil. The United States wants to have a secure supply of oil. There is a national security interest in, in Israel and in preserving Israel's security. But there is also a national security interest in having a prosperous, stable, democratic Middle East. And the thing which, which provoked Bush to have his freedom agenda in the first place, which is this sense of these autocratic states are producing a situation inside these states that ultimately is fostering terrorism and therefore is bad for us. If that's right, and I think it was at least partly right, then the Arab Spring is the single most hopeful sign of what would in the end bring an end or seriously diminish Islamic terrorism that we have had since 9-11. Mm -hmm. So as you try to look beyond the current events, uh, are there certain places where you are more hopeful than others? Um, and do you sense that there may be some big disruption on the horizon in certain countries that maybe haven't had it to date? The, the places that I, I think I'm probably most hopeful I'm hopeful about Morocco because it's a relatively more progressive state, and the king there has made some serious concessions, including ending his own official constitutional role as commander of the faithful. And I'm hopeful about Tunisia, where they're going to have elections soon. Um, I'm very worried about Egypt. I mean, in the long run, good. In the short run, very worried. Um, I'm very worried about Bahrain uh, and and. Syria and Yemen, it's just very hard to see your way to anything remotely like a happy ending. What, what will that mean if there's not a happy ending, especially in places well, like Syria, Bahrain and, and, and Yemen? Well, different kinds of things. Syria, the fear, is a kind of civil war. Syria is a very, very heterogeneous place. We, we tend to think of the Middle East, oh, they're all Arabs, they're all Muslim. Well, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Syria has Alawites, it has Christians, it has Druze, it has Kurds. So far, the Middle East has not found a way of having an effective multi-ethnic society. The counterexample is Lebanon, which is, as we say, Lebanonized, or Lebanized, meaning Balkanized. And so the worry is that, that the Assad family has kept a kind of cap on this, and that when the cap is removed, you'll have real civil war. Bahrain, a very different situation, it's, but it's run by, like in Syria, it's run by a minority population. The Alawites in Syria, which is what the Assad family are, is 10 or 15 percent of Syria. The Sunnis in Bahrain, and you have a Sunni monarchy, are 30, 35 percent. It's a people monkey with the numbers a lot, and the rest are Shia. And the Shias have had it with being treated as second-class citizens. Right now, there's a stalemate. The Bahraini monarchy has succeeded in getting their way, but it's not a long-term stable situation. So uh, that's a danger as well.
what does that mean for the U.S. military presence in Bahrain and the proximity to the oil fields right. of Saudi well, that's, Arabia? That's a big question because the, the specific thing is the United States Fifth Fleet is headquartered in, in Bahrain. Well, that's a big form of leverage as well as being a big form of, of, of vulnerability. And I think one of the tough questions for Obama, who has publicly singled out Bahrain for criticism, is if Bahrain continues to be to refuse to negotiate with the Shias, then do you wind up backing off the way Bush did in Egypt? Or do you say, all right, here are the consequences. We're going to move the Fifth Fleet. I'm not quite sure where you move the Fifth Fleet to, but I've already heard arguments being made that the United States must be prepared to do so. That would be a big step, though. And what signal would that send to Saudi Arabia, which is so proximate? Well, so the Saudis, we haven't talked about the Saudis. The Saudis view this whole democracy thing as just a catastrophe. I mean, they don't believe in democracy for themselves. They don't believe in it for anybody else. Their concern is purely balance of power. Their fear is Shia encirclement. And so um, they view Bahrain as essentially a kind of Saudi colony, uh, but a colony which is majority Shia. And that's why when the, the political uh, protest reached its height, the Saudis responded by sending in the military force. Now, technically, Bahrain asked for it, but really it was the Saudis. They, they got the Emiratis to go with them. And so right now, Bahrain is, is an occupied country. Uh, and whether a Saudi army is going to be there or not, the Saudis are going to be very careful about allowing any kind of meaningful change. And I think the United States, which doesn't have a lot of leverage right now with Saudi Arabia, has got to persuade them that it is in the long-term interest of the region, of Saudi Arabia, of the United States, to have a serious political dialogue, which makes the Shias feel like they are equal citizens in their own country, which they do not feel right now. How big of an issue do you think all of this will be in the U.S. 2012 presidential election? Is this something that will be discussed, debated, uh, or will, will it be just pushed into that area of foreign policy concerns that most people don't pay attention to? Some elections really are about foreign policy, but it's not normal. And so since 9-11, it has mattered a lot. And uh, obviously George Bush ultimately was a foreign policy president. He succeeded and then he failed based on his foreign policy. Uh, I think that, uh, that as soon as Bush ended, Obama came along, uh, that became less important, and then the economic crisis pushed everything out of the way. So my guess is that none of these issues will figure that much in the presidential election. Israel is the only one that is politically salient enough, and that's something that almost can only cause Obama harm, and he's trying very hard to minimize that harm. The other issues, I just don't think they're going to matter very much. Mm -hmm. How, what about foreign policy in general? It won't uh, matter very at, much. At all, at all even, the, even the wars? I think that Obama has, in a way, Obama has neutralized the traditional criticism of the Democrats of being soft on defense, in somewhat in the way that Bill Clinton neutralized the claim that they were soft on crime or soft on welfare or something like that. So by killing Osama bin Laden, he's been able to say, I did the tough thing. I tracked down the bad guy who George Bush wanted to get but, but couldn't get. By drawing down the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, he has minimized discontent among his own base. And so uh, from the point of view of the Republicans, they have a tremendous club to beat Obama with in the form of the failed economy. Foreign policy is not a very useful club. It's not quite clear what, where they pick it up by. The, one of the main claims being made by Mitt Romney, who's probably the likest, likeliest candidate, is America needs to spend much more money on defense. Well, it's not going to. That's not going to happen. And the American people are not going to give, are not going to turn that into an applause line because they really want to see you cut spending, including on defense. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Traub. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.
This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF.